Now then, you're welcome, Max. So uh, like much of the world, we're still digesting a certain facts sent to Barcelona headquarters yesterday evening. In the opinion of Lionel Messi's legal team, his request now triggers a clause in his contract which allows him to leave for free. Barcelona hierarchy have a different interpretation. In their eyes, a 700 million euro buyout clause remains intact. A compromise of sorts may be found. Regardless, it would seem that Messi at Barcelona and that era is no more. We're joined by Simon Cooper from the Financial Times. Simon, evening. Hi, how are you? Yeah, great to have you with us. Surreal to think of Messi wearing a different club jersey for starters. I think he wanted to stay there forever, ideally. And he just grew so disappointed with the bad transfer policy, the failure to replace an aging team. He blames the board for that. And he can't see how in the next couple of years they're going to be a great side and you know Messi plays for great sides he's always said the most important thing for me is to have a winning project and I just think he can't see that at Barcelona for the next period you're writing a book on Barcelona at the moment you mentioned this in the Financial Times this afternoon one of the <laughs> kind of more um incidental but interesting points you made was you happened to drive by Messi's house I must say I'd never given much thought before to Messi's house I didn't happen to drive by it. I got talking to the taxi driver and she lived in Castel de Fels and she said, well, I'll show you Messi's house. He's, you know, sort of a neighbor of mine. And she drove us past it and it was very interesting because it was just so unspectacular. It's kind of what you'd expect of a fairly wealthy person in the suburbs of say Orange County or Hertfordshire. Uh, he's built, he's bought his neighbor's house. He's put them both together. He's built this high fence for privacy. There's bougainvillea and palm trees you can't see in. Um, but otherwise, it's very kind of calm and suburban. And I thought, if you're going to perform every week for 15 years, twice a week, this is the kind of boring, predictable life that you need. This is the kind of routine that he seems to need to sustain that. And his parents live 10 minutes away in another beach town. And so he's kind of brought his family out of the chaos of Argentina into this incredibly calm and peaceful and unglamorous. You know, there's a lot of very glamorous places in and around Barcelona, and this is not that. Okay, so it's sleepy suburbia. Yeah, just not even on the beach. I mean, it's a beach town, but he's probably about three or four miles from the beach. So, um, yeah, I mean, the whole Spanish press is actually encamped outside the, the compound right now. So I'm not giving away any secrets. No, I have never got the impression from him, and it's only reading things from afar, clearly, but that this was a great uh, difficulty for him. I never felt he was drawn to the celebrity lifestyle that Neymar, for instance, finds deeply attractive. I never felt it was a sacrifice on Messi's part to live a boring life. It seemed like exactly the kind of life he wanted to live. Yeah, I mean, people who know Messi always say he's not shy, he's not timid, he's quite assertive, but he's an introvert. And he has a very predictable circle of his family members, his wife, who he's known since childhood, and a few friends, not many. And so, yeah, this is the life that he wants. And often when a foreign footballer arrives in a new city, usually alone, he comes with an entourage of mates, maybe a physio, in Neymar's case, a hairdresser, and they all live in the house. You know, you have the entourage living in the house. That's how Maradona did it at Barcelona. But Messi had the luck that, you know, the club was willing to pay for his family to come over. And the only players who've ever come out of the Masia as foreigners and made it to the first team at Barca are Messi and Thiago Alcantara, who now plays, of course, very well for Bayern Munich. And they both had that, their families on site. It's very, very hard to do it without. In your research for the book, Simon, and uh, through the various people that you've spoken to, how would you categorize or, or, or characterize rather the extent of Messi's influence at Barcelona and the nature of his influence at Barcelona over the last couple of years? I mean, it's grown hugely because in the Guardiola era, of course, you you know, mostly the club ran itself because you had great players coming through all the time. You had a decision maker in charge, Guardiola, who knew what he wanted. So Messi didn't really have to do much. Occasionally he'd intervene, like saying to Guardiola, you have to kick Slatan out of the team because he's playing in my position. But mostly Messi wants somebody else to make the decisions. He doesn't want to be the boss. But in the last few years, as the club has become more reliant on him on the field, as uh, the transfer policy has failed, so you don't have other great players coming in, 
more and more he feels that he has to make the decisions. He has to tell the club what to do. So he said last year, you need to buy Neymar. And commercially, this was, you know, financially, this was not possible. So the directors more or less pretended to try to buy Neymar for the whole summer and then told Messi then, well, we tried, but we couldn't buy him. Messi wasn't impressed. So he feels that against his will, he's had to become a decision maker when he'd rather just be a player. But of course, he's a very uh, opinionated man. So he wants someone else to make the decisions, but he wants them to make the decisions that he would make. Mm. Okay, I understand. So grudgingly, he's had to take more maybe direct ownership over things. You had a quote in your piece in the Financial Times, a very interesting one from a former president who was telling you that quite often Messi doesn't need to speak. His body language is the strongest I have seen in my life. And I've seen him with a look in the locker room where everyone knows whether he agrees or not with the suggestion. That is uh, definitely uh, a looming presence, I would put it to you, at all times at that club. Yeah, I think his, um, the way we see him on TV is a bit misleading because he's small, he has a very inexpressive face, and he doesn't really feel any need to project his personality to us. He doesn't care about that. He wants to show us his football, but he doesn't want to show us his personality. Inside the club, he wants to make his views known. And of course, when something big happens, like when a coach is being sacked or when there's talk of buying Griezmann, everybody looks at Messi. Does he want this? And if Messi wants this, like in the case of Neymar, then a more articulate player like Piquet, Gerard Piquet, will, you know, voice the thoughts and, um, you know, be a kind of spokesman for the movement. But everyone looks to look, actually literally looks at Messi's face first. Mm. So he is more forthcoming behind the scenes then in terms of, because uh, when you mentioned the lack, lack of expression in his face, I certainly get that. I mean, everybody marvels at his football. How could you not? But I don't I don't have a feel for him, really, as a person. He gives so little away. He doesn't want us to have a feel for him. He doesn't care about that. I mean, for him, the outside world is just people holding up smartphones at his face and, and uh, shouting his name and asking for his autograph. He can't really go outside much anyway, you know, mm. because of his celebrity. Other players can go for dinner in Barcelona. He can't really. So... He he doesn't have a particular relationship to us, and he isn't a kind of body narcissist like Cristiano Ronaldo seems to be, that he wants people to kind of admire the, the body and the clothes. Messi just wants you to see his football. Did you get the impression from people you spoke to that he's well-liked in the club, or is it, is, has he kind of almost morphed into some kind of fear and trepidation and walking on eggshells around him? I mean... I know that Suarez and Jordi Alba are genuine friends of his and they were on holiday with him. I think, I mean, he doesn't seek to be liked by lots of people. He's not the kind of backslapping guy. There's one of the support staff, this kind of old fat guy, very kind of unglamorous figure. It looks like a janitor who is always around Messi. They have a special friendship relationship. He liked Villanova. So he has a few people in the club he's close to. But, I mean, he, he, he doesn't seek to have a, a big social circle. I think most people are in awe of him. I mean, Frankie de Jong told me that Barcelona is a team of great footballers, which I think is true despite the 8-2. But he said there's one player who is much better than everybody else, and everybody knows it. So, you know, you have a dressing room of people who've won World Cups, who've won the biggest prizes, and they know they are much less good than this guy. And so that creates a kind of awe relationship. Yes. And he earns, you know, by one calculation, 40% of the salary bill of the whole playing squad. Which is an extraordinary gap and probably unprecedented, really, at pretty much every or every other football club. But I suppose, as you for the reasons you've just outlined, maybe there's an understanding in the dressing room that, well, he is messy after all. I mean, in football clubs, there are hierarchies, which are very clear. So, for example... At Liverpool, Gerard was the boss. He was not the most articulate person. He wasn't the guy who talked most, but his what he wanted was law, and he was the guy you sought to impress. And at top clubs, it's often about quality. So Gerard was the best player mm. at Liverpool. Messi is by far the best player at Barcelona. At smaller clubs, it's often about who's cool, because you know the difference of quality at smaller clubs is often not very big. So it's who's cool, who's been playing for the club a long time, who has a dressing room clique. At the top, Quality is really decisive. That's how you judge people. 
Mm. It does seem like a clicky dressing room with Messi very much obviously at the core of the click and it's those with Barcelona DNA in their bones and outsiders struggle to penetrate quite often. I think they're quite generous to outsiders because they feel a responsibility to the club, which is unusual in football. So the four captains, Messi, Busquets, Piquet and Sergio Roberto, they've all been at the club since childhood. They do care about Barcelona, so they will be quite welcoming to newcomers. They'll test them, you know, in the, the rondos, the piggy in the middle games to see if a guy can has perfect control, etc. Mm. But they are open to it. Uh, you know, there was resentment of Griezmann because he'd indicated he earlier didn't want to come to Barcelona. I think that one of the difficulties now is that Messi's best friends, Jordi Alba and Suarez, Suarez has been told he has to leave. I think Messi could live with that, but Kuman, who's not a man of many words and who's not a kind of hugely courteous guy, he's a typical old Dutchman. He called Suarez and the conversation, you have to go, was less than one minute. And Messi felt this was disrespectful. And Barcelona is a very courteous place. Uh, you don't say things directly to people's faces. You, um, you show consideration. It's very hard to say something mean. And so Messi is outraged that Suarez was disposed of without all honours. And that um, definitely disposed them against the new coach who otherwise could have been an, an ally because Kuman wanted him to stay. And Kuman also said, look, under me, you won't have any privileges. Mm. And Messi found that insulting. And I mean, again, I think it's, I grew up in Holland. I think it's very Dutch to lead with, um, with bad news. Yeah. And Kuman didn't spend a huge amount of time apparently saying, you know, I love you, you're the greatest ever. Which seems quite naive, to be honest. I think Kuman didn't want Messi as the leader. And one of the problems with Messi, which everyone acknowledges, is that he doesn't defend anymore, and nor does Suarez. And so the old pressing game that, that Barcelona played for many years, that they perfected, they don't, they don't press at all, really. And the best pressing teams in the business are now Liverpool and Bayern Munich, who are just streets ahead. And so if you're going to play the Barcelona game, you can't play it with Messi as he has become the player who covers least kilometers of any other footballer in Europe, pretty much. But implicit in Kuman telling them, you know, your privileges are over. He is saying you've been getting away with things. And how else would Messi react to that but badly? I think Kuman is a plain speaker and Messi comes from, has grown up in, cultures where that is not done. So I think there was a, an immediate clash there. But it may be that Kuman is happy for Bartomeu to take the blame for Messi going. And Kuman will now have the opportunity and a much bigger budget to build a new team, a team that, that's hardworking and young and presses, etc. Okay. So maybe Kuman's a shrewder operator than I'm giving him credit for here. Maybe he knew exactly what he was doing. I think he's blunt, and I think he wasn't devastated that Messi left. I think he would have liked him to stay, but on Kuman's conditions. Okay. So in your uh, research for the book, and you mentioned the last five years and a billion spent on transfers, and, and, and you know rather famously, they haven't a whole amount to show for it of late. We, how have they got that so spectacularly wrong with all the many, many millions they've handed out to different players? I mean, there is a lot of naivete in constructing a very old team. You already have an old team, and then you buy Griezmann, who's 28. Seems a bit bizarre. And now Pjanic is 30 coming in, you know, for counting reasons. They, they didn't really pay any attention to age structures. I mean, one of the issues is there's many forces at Barcelona, each wanting their own transfers. So you've got the president and his men. You have the sporting director who changes almost every year, and then you have the senior players. So often none of them consult the coach about who they want. So the process is very messy, uh, not, to, not to try and make a pun. And then you have the problem of Messi, so that often the players you're buying were the Lionel Messi of their past club. So Coutinho had been the Messi of Liverpool and Griezmann had been the Messi of Atletico Madrid. The guy who is given the ball all the time, who starts the attack, who has a free role, who doesn't have to defend as much. And then the mini Messi comes to Barcelona and suddenly he doesn't get the ball and he struggles. He can't really find a role. 
And so, I mean, that's poorly thought through, of course, by the club. But it's hard. I mean, the players who are complementary with Messi, so Suarez finishes off Messi's attacks, works very well. The young Neymar ran onto Messi's passes, worked very well. When Neymar wanted to be Messi himself, which great players tend to want to, they want to be the number 10 free role, that doesn't work. And, yeah, I mean, transfers are very hard to get right. The last thing is that the system Barcelona play was very complex. Um, it's a uh, one-touch game of possession in a 40-meter 40, 40 band. It's just very difficult to get used to that. What do you suspect, Simon, is the most natural fit for Messi going forward then? The problem for any player leaving Barcelona, you know, as it were, as a success, is there's only three or four clubs who can afford to buy you. With Messi, who can afford him? I mean... He actually has very little choice because, you know, let's say the transfer fee has been talked about at 220 million plus a salary, his salary. Maybe Manchester City can do it. Paris Saint Germain said they can't. I mean, it will be a process of elimination. Whoever can pay that salary. City would seem to be a decent fit given that Messi doesn't really care too much who the coach is, but he did work quite well with Guardiola and Guardiola knows how to talk to him. So, it's hard to see any other club getting in there instead. Mm. Why do you say Messi doesn't care too much who the coach is? Messi sees football as the, a player's game. He thinks that if you have great players on the field, like Barcelona did with you know Xavi and Iniesta and Neymar and Suarez, they'll sort it out. He, he doesn't particularly care much about any kind of tactical briefings by a coach. Okay. He, he just wants the coach to let him play football. Okay, I guess maybe that is the natural vantage point of perhaps the greatest footballer of all time. So well, the, the, cult, the cult of Guardiola might have been something he would crack a wry smile at in his private moments. He doesn't listen to all that stuff. He doesn't. He's not very interested in football as a spectator game, as a you know something that we talk about. He he wouldn't listen to programs like this in Spain, as it were. Yeah, he he doesn't care about all that stuff. He thinks coaches are overrated. Um, the other thing is that of course the coach provides tactical analysis. But who is the best analyst of a football game while it's happening? It's Messi. Messi sees the space better than Guardiola, better than anyone else can. So the extent to which he needs a coach is very limited. Do we know, is he passionate or interested about anything in his, in his private life? He drives his kids to school. He takes them to the local restaurant, you know, and they have a kind of private room, very simple place for dinners. He, he plays football with his sons. Um, no, he doesn't really, he, he doesn't have an exciting life, no. Mm. So simplicity and calm have been the hallmarks of the last 15 years. This will be for him a big change and a big move. Now, maybe the flip side of that point is, well, he simply copies and pastes his very boring life very easily onto any city in Europe because effectively it's not about the city he's in, it's just about his immediate circle and it'll be just fine. He'll have settled in three days in. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine he speaks much English. I mean, one of the interesting things is that his sons actually attend the Colegio Britannico, the, the British school, right. uh, which is very common among the Catalan elite to send your children to foreign schools, French language, German language, English language. So maybe the English learning of his children is part of the motivation. Who knows? Certainly they would be better placed in a way to make the move than he is. What span or what era is your book going to cover when it comes to Barcelona, Simon? Well, Messi has very handily provided me with the ending, which <laughs> I wouldn't have until last week. But it starts with Johan Cruyff, who the man who made Barcelona, the architect of the whole thing. So it starts with Johan Cruyff landing there in 1973, and it ends on, what was it, August 25th, when Messi hands in his transfer request, I guess. Yes. So at, at various points especially in the last 15 years, Cruyff had the year of um, the president, you'll remind me of his name. Uh, Laporta. Yeah, Cruyff had the year of Laporta. And there is this hope that Xavi will be act three following Cruyff and Guardiola and come back and, you know, reinstall all those values. How optimistic would you be of that happening? You know, that Cruyff's influence even beyond the grave can still dictate the flow of this club. Well, Krebs' basic idea of football works. It's uh, we have the ball, we play in your half, we press, 
we pass, when we lose it, we win it back at once. We overlap, we change positions. And who does that now? That's Liverpool and Bayern Munich. And it works. You know, they play, they play the kind of game he described with a football playing goalkeeper, you know, with a, a goalkeeper who can pass. Mm. So it's almost a blueprint modernized for 2020 of what Kreuf was talking about 50 years ago is what Bayern do now. Mm. And Bayern, no coincidence, brought in two Kreufian managers, uh, Louis van Gaal and Guardiola, to make that happen. And so that could be Barca. Barca could, you know, it won't happen at once because they don't have any money to buy good new players and they have a very old team. But there is a model that works and they will have to go back to their academy, which is producing players who can play that system and give it five years. I think Safi's waiting for the right moment to step in. Mm. And the job does seem to be his when he wants it. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the downside risk for him is that Kumon is an incredible success. They win everything this season, they win the Champions League, and then it's hard to push him aside. But given the, the playing squad, I can't see that happening. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. Do you suspect Barcelona are desperately trying to keep Messi just now? I think the board is very torn because on the one hand, you don't want to be the president who let Messi go. Mm. And in the last 10 years, they lost Krauf as honorary president. He resigned his position before he died. They lost Guardiola and now they're losing Messi. And so for Bartomeu, the president's a huge humiliation. There's a complication though, which is that when you leave as a board and there's elections due in the next few months, you have to show that the financial accounts are clean, that there's no big new debts, and if there are, you, the board members, personally have to pay them out of your own pocket. You have to cover them. And of course, the club is in an enormous financial mess because of the failures on the field, the bad transfers, and now the coronavirus. So this is happening at a terrible moment. So the one way to get the accounts in order is to say, well, Messi, we couldn't keep him, but here we got 220 million euros for him. So now we, you know, the accounts look pretty good. Okay. So I think Bartomeu is in a is in a terrible, you know, choice over what to do. One last point then, regardless of where he goes, say it's Manchester City, uh, for, for argument's sake, to what extent is, is, is bringing Messi also bringing a problem? Now, it's a first-class problem and it's a problem clubs would like to have, but he will be very shortly 34. You have to think dramatically-ish on the wane relatively soon. And you've talked about his presence and his the body language even, for instance, and he will still, to some extent or other, be... Uh, the top dog in the dressing room to some extent or other. So, you know, you're bringing in someone that very, very soon you're going to have to upset potentially by not playing. Um, so well, on, I mean, he's the baggage far, that you bring. He's huh? by far the best player in the world. Okay, but in two, three years I'm talking about. So you give him a two-year contract and you say, look, in two years' time we'll see how you're placed. And if 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 you're still great, like you know, Cristiano, two years old, is still great, then then perfect. We'll we'll keep you on. Who would not want him? So, you know, and Guardiola can and say for argument's sake, say we're sitting in the board and we're discussing this now, and you're you make that point. The counterpoint would be, okay, say we bring him in, and in two years it's very clear we're not going to offer him an extension, and he sees the writing on the wall about six months out. So then, pretty much a year to eighteen months into our two-year contract, we've got a player who's not happy because he knows we're not going to give him an extension. He wants an extension. I've got his people ringing me every week. Meanwhile, he's sulking down there in the dressing room and influencing all the young players with him. I, I don't see Messi as a guy who coasts. I mean, you always have the older player who's discontented and who's on the way out. But this guy is so much about top-class achievement. He monitors himself for the moment when that fades. And I don't think he's going to believe he's still great when he isn't great anymore. I mean, he's talked about how he's coming to the end. He's, he's heading for the final years. He, um, he's very realistic. So I, I don't think that he believes he can play forever. Okay. We're all realistic until it's us. Yeah, but I mean, two years time, he'll be 35. I mean, he can still play almost anywhere else in the world. You know, everyone would still have him. Yeah. But I mean, he also lives very well. You know, he's practically vegan during the season. He, he consults nutritionists all the time. He's very, very um, careful and he preserves himself by not defending. So Guardiola will have to, you know, understand that that's part of the deal. And the other City players will have to understand that as well. 
Mm. Okay. Well, sure for the, for, the like sheer, for the sheer thrill of it, you've convinced me. Let's sign him. Two years, 50 million a year. He can like it or lump it. Uh, when's the book coming out, by the way? Uh, sometime next year. We have to decide on the exact date, which, as you'll understand, is not, not completely clear now. Okay, next very year. good. Well, listen, uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, Simon Cooper writing about the messy situation in the Financial Times, which you can get online or I'm sure in your uh, local shop as well. Simon, thanks so much. Thank you, Joe.